Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. Uh, on our last lecture, we discussed and learned a little bit about uh, Hellenic or Greek art and literature. And today, uh, Dr. Forrest will enlighten us on Hellenic philosophy or Greek philosophy. Now, I'm sure that you've heard a lot of, of these philosophers. They're very famous, most of them. And so this will not be something that you're hearing for the first time. But Dr. Forrest will um, go more in depth about the Greek philosophers that, of course, will um, actually shape uh, Western thought as well and, and their ideas. Um, we're talking 6th, 7th century BC uh, for this lecture on Hellenic or Greek philosophy. Dr. Forrest will uh, talk about a philosopher by the name of Thales um, and his uh, understanding of the cosmos and his reason and observation. She will also, of course, um, enlighten us on some of the pre-Socratic philosophers, um, men like Pythagoras. I'm sure you, you may have heard of the Pythagorean theorem, so these actually uh, he deals with, um, he was a mathematician and he was an astronomer. And he's also trying to understand the cosmos, which is very common with a lot of these philosophers of this age here in Greece. Um, some other of the philosophers, probably uh, Democritus, Dr. Forrest will talk about Democritus, and uh, also, understanding the cosmos seems to be a common unifying theme here, trying to explain it. Uh, he actually believed, which is interesting since they didn't have a microscope at this time, but he believed that the basic element was of the universe was the atom, a tiny invisible particle um, that you can't see with the naked eye. So that was, that was pretty amazing on uh, Democritus's part there. And of course, you, you can't uh, have a lecture about Greek philosophy without learning a bit about Socrates uh, and how he comes to be um, a martyr, I guess, for Greek philosophy. He's actually executed by the Athenian government because Socrates had um, a way of questioning everybody. He, he questioned. He would come up to you in public and he would, before you left, you're like, I don't know what's my name. I don't know what my name is because he's constantly asking questions. Do we really know? Um, he questioned the existence of the gods, okay? That was not a very healthy thing to do. And uh, he was charged with corrupting the youth in Athens and eventually um, is executed, although he drinks poison. Um, it was under orders of execution that he does so. So you'll learn more about Socrates before his execution, of course, and the death of Socrates, which was uh, a very famous um, execution in Greek history. You will also, of course, um, hear about Plato. Plato, another famous Greek philosopher, uh, Plato's Academy that he will create um, that will teach um, basic subjects, uh, liberal arts, and his writings called the Republic. Dr. Forrest will talk about what Plato believed in and, and what he wrote about in the Republic, um, basically thinking that philosopher kings should be at the top of the pyramid and that they were the wisest. Um, of the kings. They should be trained to, to rule in Athens and the guardians and the producers, um, talking about the different levels of society in this republic. Also, of course, Plato is famous for his um, symbolism and his use of ideas, and he uses a cave as an example, and, and the fire that's produced and the shadows that are portrayed, that are, are thrown onto the walls of the cave in order to explain um, some of his philosophy. And Dr. Forrest will talk more about that, of course, and, and what that exactly means um, with his use of this cave allegory. 
And of course you can't obviously, again, talk about Greek or Hellenic philosophy without discussing Aristotle. Very famous Aristotle. He actually tutored Alexander the Great, which is coming up very soon in um, one of our future lectures. Aristotle and his Lyceum, uh, how he viewed ethics and politics and uh, natural history and metaphysics. Uh, Dr. Forrest will discuss his views on all of that. And of course, his logic, Aristotle, around oh, late, mid 300s BC. Okay, and so Dr. Forrest will basically hit on some of the, the main philosophers of this time here in Athens. Um, and we'll, of course, you know, in, in past lectures, we've discussed the Greeks during the Bronze Age and the Dark Ages. We've discussed Greek religion or mythology. Um, you've also learned about the different city-states. In fact, Plato, by the way, admired Sparta. He admired the city-state of Sparta, which you have already learned about in a past lecture. And, of course, Athens and, and their gradual development toward a democratic government. Uh, a little bit about the culture in uh, Greece and, of course, today uh, a little bit about Greek philosophy. And you'll notice that it's a lot of this is centered around, you know, not all, but a lot of it is centered around the city-state of Athens. Athens was very open to foreign ideas. Athens was very cultural, unlike, of course, Sparta, who was culturally isolated. Sparta did not welcome any kind of new ideas. They liked to keep their old system of soldiers in place. Um, but Athens was a, a mecca for culture. Um, and these philosophers, of course, obviously uh, Socrates wasn't quite so lucky. But um, they will, for the most part, be able to, to come up with these different um, ideas about the universe, about government, about politics, uh, about um, just who, you know, the, the people that are existing and, and thinking. Um, so I hope you enjoy this lecture by Dr. Forrest on Hellenic philosophy. One of the signature contributions to Western civilization is philosophy that came from the early Greeks. So today we're going to be talking about the beginning of Greek philosophy um, in Greece um, in the 7th through the 5th centuries BCE. Um, Greek philosophy actually began um, on the western coast of Asia Minor, even before Athens was a great academic city. You'll see on my first slide um, arrows pointing to some of the major cities from which the early philosophers came. Um, you can see in an area called Ionia, which is on the western coast of Asia Minor, which is now Turkey, uh, was an area of great academic centers, great schools, centers of learning. And there were several cities which produced early philosophers, the city of Samos, the city of Miletus, you'll see arrows pointing to them, uh, the city of Clazomenae, and up in northern Greece, the city of Abdera. Now these cities were centers of learning before Athens became the great center of learning that it later became. So we'll be focusing on first on the pre-Socratic philosophers, the, the ones who came before Socrates, uh, who came from these cities. Um, the first pre-Socratic philosopher that I want to introduce to you um, is Thales of Miletus, who lived from 624 to 528 BCE. So Greek philosophy actually began in the 7th century BCE. What was unique about these people, uh, all of the early Greek philosophers, was that they focused on looking for a different type of explanation than the traditional Greek religious explanations of the cosmos. What these 
people did was to start looking for explanations based on reason, explanations of the natural world, the cosmos that they observed, based on reason and observation. This is what made them different, and this is what was unique about Greek philosophy. And it began in this area of the world probably because these men had access to what was the most advanced education available in Western civilization at the time. So Thales was looking for a unified understanding of the world, one simple understanding of the cosmos that would explain pretty much everything. And he believed that everything was basically some manifestation of water. Now you'll notice in the slide we have a picture of him, a bust. We're not sure that this is what he looked like. We really don't know what these people looked like. But we have busts of, of their likenesses that were done by later people, and this is Thales of Miletus, who believed that everything basically was some form of water. Uh, the next pre-Socratic philosopher in the uh, sixth century was Pythagoras of Samos, who was a mathematician, he was an astronomer. He also was looking for a unified understanding of the cosmos, trying to explain it as simply as possible. But he took a mystical turn, which was a little bit different from, uh, from Thales. Pythagoras believed that the universe is really based on numbers, that it's some physical manifestation of numbers. We live in a mathematical world. And so his explanation of the cosmos, his understanding of reality was mathematical. And he came up with, for example, the Pythagorean theorem, that for every right triangle, the square of the hypotenuse equals the sum of the squares of its two sides, which we call the Pythagorean theorem, which you've had to learn to prove in geometry class. But he was one of the early predecessors of Plato, for example, and very influential on Plato, and we'll talk about him in just a little while. Another of the pre-Socratic philosophers was Anaxagoras of Clazomenae, who lived from 500 to 428 BC. Um, like Thales, he was looking for a natural explanation of the cosmos rather than a supernatural explanation. He depended on reason and observation, and he was also looking for a unified or simple explanation of the cosmos. Now for him, it was something different than it was for Thales. For Anaxagoras, everything was a manifestation of mind, some form of n mind, which he called nous as you'll see in the slide, was the ordering principle of the cosmos. He seems to be, have been one of the earliest philosophers looking for what we would now call natural laws to explain uh, the workings of nature. After Anaxagoras comes Democritus of Abdera um, in the fifth century BCE. Democritus also, like the other pre-Socratics, was looking for natural explanations based on reason and observation. Um, his understanding of the cosmos, that everything was composed of small material particles called atoms. So he was an early materialist. Democritus did not believe in the supernatural. He thought that everything was some manifestation of physical substance. And he thought that they all reduced down to very small atomic particles. Um, and this is, all of the pre-Socratics, though, were unified in the sense that they were all looking for natural explanations that they developed on the basis of reason and observation. This is what made them all early pre-Socratic philosophers. Now, by pre-Socratic, what we mean is that these people all were the predecessors of Socrates, but Socrates did not take the same approach to philosophy that the pre-Socratics did. They were interested in explaining the physical cosmos. He was interested in only one thing, and that was living the best moral life possible so that you could be the best citizen possible. So Socrates was interested in ethics. He was interested in moral philosophy, and his chief aim was to hold the governing council of Athens accountable for their corruption to try to improve the city. Um, and so he stressed loyalty to the polis or the city-state. You'll see that word on the slide. Polis was the Greek term for city-state, but it actually meant community or society, not the location. It meant the people, the community. Socrates always stressed living an ethical life, a life of moral self-examination, which he was very concerned um, to um, impart to his fellow citizens. He called himself the gadfly. He was a person who went around engaging other Athenians, especially politicians, um, in 
items which he considered of importance, usually some moral virtue that he considered important for people to have. Um, he urged them to examine their opinions, to examine their lives, and to improve themselves morally so that they could contribute better politically to the city. Um, in return for his constant um, questioning and badgering of people and engaging people in conversation and asking them questions. He eventually was put on trial. He was tried for introducing false gods to the city of Athens and thereby corrupting the youth. These were trumped up charges. They were not true, but they were intended to remove him as a source of agitation in the city of Athens. And he was eventually um, actually killed. He was put on trial. This is very famous. He was tried by the city of Athens. He was convicted by a, a jury of 501 people, his fellow Athenians. He lost by about 30 votes. And, but his parting message to his fellow citizens upon his execution was, the unexamined life is not worth living. If you are a human being who is capable of reason and examination, self-examination, then that is what you should do. It will make you a better citizen. Um, I have here a slide of a very famous painting from the 18th century called The Death of Socrates. Socrates was actually executed in 399 BCE, but this painting by Jacques-Louis David in 1787 shows the grief of his um, friends and his disciples when he was forced to drink the poison hemlock and essentially um, uh, undertake his own execution. You, uh, it, it's a very famous painting that shows that he was not afraid to die and he was the first person in Western history to die for the sake of an idea. Uh, in other words, the right to dissent, to criticize your government. Um, the next slide is a very famous painting that was inspired by Athenian philosophy. It's called The School of Athens by the great Renaissance painter Raphael in 1510. Um, Raphael has all of the pre-Socratics, all of the important Athenian philosophers, as uh, Socrates, I'm sorry, uh, Plato and Aristotle in the center. And you'll see focusing on the center of the painting in the next slide, um, that Raphael wanted to capture the essential differences between Plato and Aristotle. Now, Plato was Socrates' disciple. Socrates never had a school. He never wrote anything that we are aware of, but yet Plato learned a great deal from him. Uh, and Plato followed him in concentrating on an an upward or, or a non-physical dimension of reality called the forms that we'll talk about in just a minute. And Raphael portrayed that by having Plato in this famous painting pointing upward um, to the area where the forms were uh, represented as existing. And he portrays, Raphael portrays Aristotle as holding his hand downward because Aristotle focused on the here and the now, the material world, the world of li everyday life and society, which he believed was the source of knowledge. So now let's focus on Plato and Aristotle and look at the, their major ideas. And in looking at them, you'll see what the differences were. Um, here is a slide of an idealized version of Plato's academy. Plato had a school. He was a natural born Athenian, which meant that he had citizenship and he could own property. So he owned his own school, which he called the academy. And a mosaic of an idealized um, scene from the academy was found in Pompeii uh, in Rome, po Roman Pompeii in 79 CE, which shows him sitting around with his students, engaging them in the type of conversational uh, teaching style that he had learned from Socrates. Uh, the actual ruins of Plato's Academy are believed to still exist in, in Athens, and here you see a scene of what are believed to be the ruins of Plato's school in Athens, Greece. It is actually a tourist attraction. Um, Plato's philosophy was a development, a continuation of Socrates' belief in something called the forms. Forms are essentially nothing but qualities. They are qualities that exist in their own right. For example, the quality of justice, as you see in the slide. Um, but the highest form is the, the form of the good. He see, sometimes called forms the ideas. And so the form of the good was the idea of the good, um, with the, 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 the principle being that ideas or forms are things that can be seen only with the mind. Only the intellect is sufficient to enable people to know the forms, to understand these qualities uh, which give them a true and genuine understanding of things like justice. Um, and so Plato believed, because the real city of Athens was so corrupt, uh, he wanted to create 
an ideal city. And so in his dialogue entitled The Republic, he has Socrates sitting around with some other gentlemen uh, and they decide to build a city in words. And so they build uh, what Plato called The Republic, an ideal city. If you could have the perfect city, what would it be like? Um, and so Plato has Socrates and these other gentlemen talking about what would be the perfect city. If they could build their own city, what would it be like? Well, it would be um, the, the greatest segment of the city would be the producers, people whose chief interest is in earning money um, and who are gifted at um, working and doing business and building things and growing things and making things. And because they would be the greatest segment of the population, they would be educated to do this type of work, and they would take their place in the city as the producers. And the chief virtue that these people would need to govern, because their appetites govern their lives, the chief virtue that these people needed was temperance, the ability to control their appetites, their physical appetites, from whence came their desire for power. Um, and so the broad base of the population of the Republic would be the producers. Next would be the guardians or the military. These would be people in whom their chief characteristic would be passion and spirit and courage. And so their chief virtue would be courage. They would be charged with protecting the city from internal and external threats. Um, but the city would be governed, the ideal city would be governed by the most well-educated people in society, those with the greatest amount of wisdom, who during the course of their education would come to know the good, the highest of all the forms. And so the people who would eventually, uh, because of their instruction in philosophy, come to know the good, which is the highest, in English the best way to express it is that it's, it's pure excellence. They would understand that this, this pure excellence is the source of all the different specific forms of goodness that are found in society. And so the philosophers, these young students, would, would know the good at the end of their formal education, and as a result of their knowledge of the good, they would understand the true meaning of justice. And because they would understand the true meaning of justice, they would understand the true meaning of wisdom, the true meaning of courage, and the true meaning of temperance. And so this relatively small group of people, men and women alike, because in the Republic there would be total gender equality, this small group of people would be responsible for convincing their fellow citizens to, live, to give them political authority and to live according to the guidance of their own wisdom. That would be a very difficult job. Philosophers don't typically want to go into politics, but they would be persuaded to do this because they owed their cities a, a tremendous debt for providing them with such a wonderful education. Um, and so the philosopher kings would govern by virtue of their wisdom, and they would be responsible for convincing the guardians, the military, to do their proper job in society, which is to use their courage to protect the city, and to convince the producers, the, the greatest number of people in, in the city, to do their jobs properly. And it, all three portions of the city, the philosophers who would become the kings if, if, the, the, if the guardians and the, the producers permitted this, um, if their fellow citizens allowed them to govern, then they would uh, be charged with using the force of rational persuasion um, to convince the guardians to guard the city, the producers to do their job, and then everybody would be doing their proper job for which they were trained and educated, and, th and there would be a just city. A just city is one in which all of the parts of the city function as they were intended to do and create a, a harmonious social order. Um, and all of this is governed by the form of the good or pure excellence, which only the philosophers would actually understand. So they would have a very tough job. They'd have to convince their fellow citizens that they knew how to govern. Um, and they would eventually, um, have, when they finished their formal education at the age of 35, they'd have to spend 15 years uh, doing civil service work, sort of, so to speak, to show that they could do the type of administrative work that would be required of them. One of Plato's famous uh, metaphors or allegories or stories for how hard this was going to be for the philosophers to govern is his allegory of the cave. And you see there a wonderful representation in the next slide of what Plato conceived uh, society to be like. Plato believed that the body was the prison of the soul 
and that by living in a physical existence in a social world, a social and physical world, people would get distracted. And so life in the physical and social world was like being in a dark cave um, where you didn't know really that anything was going on outside the cave. And so the darkness is meant to symbolize um, the darkness of ignorance, the enslavement of, of mere opinion as opposed to knowledge. And so there you see prisoners in the cave, uh, you see people behind them controlling the images that they see and they think that these images are reality. But eventually a few people do get out of the cave and this is meant to symbolize the fact that education takes people from ignorance and mere opinion to understanding and true knowledge and true wisdom. And so as you see in the next slide, Plato represents the exterior of the cave as a bright sunlit world. Um, the sun represents the good and this bright sunlit outer world represents the dimension of reality that he called the forms. Uh, the true understanding of the qualities that enable people to live good lives. And so there you see a, a beautiful picture that represents exactly what Plato thought knowledge would bring. It would bring light, it would bring um, illumination into the mind so that uh, the philosophers would have the wisdom to go back down into the cave and govern their fellow citizens. Now, if they were lucky, their fellow citizens would accept their wisdom, their wise guidance, um, and they would have a harmonious society. But Plato had his own teacher in mind when he told this story because he knew that probably what would happen is that the fellow citizens would resist uh, the philosopher's efforts to guide them to living better lives and to becoming better citizens. And at the very worst, their fellow citizens might resent this so much that they would actually kill the philosopher, kill the messenger. And this is exactly what had happened to Socrates. And so Plato's idea was that philosophers being charged with civic duty to go back down and use their wisdom to govern the city would be very, very difficult. Uh, and it might even result in their being killed, uh, which in the case of Socrates, it actually did. Uh, there are modern examples of this, Martin Luther King, who uh, was killed because he devoted his life to trying to bring his fellow American citizens to a higher sense of justice. Uh, Gandhi, who was martyred for exactly the same thing. His, uh, a fellow Hindu killed Gandhi, um, which is a, a modern, real-life example of Plato's message. So this is not outmoded by any means. Uh, Plato had a very famous student by the name of Aristotle. Aristotle was not a native-born Athenian. He was born in Macedon, which was in northern Greece. Um, his father was a court physician to Philip of Macedon. So Aristotle had the opportunity to serve as a tutor, actually, to, to Alexander the Great. Uh, and he, he actually started out as a biologist. He was interested in the plants and animals of, of the biological world. But at the age of 17, he went down to Athens for the express purpose of studying with Plato. Plato's school was very famous. And so at the age of 17, he became Plato's pupil and actually was the most famous of all Plato's students. Um, Aristotle was born in 384, died in 322 BCE, and there in the slide you see a, what is believed to be the ruins of his school, which he called the Lyceum. Um, Aristotle was not a native-born Athenian, so he did not have the rights of citizenship. He could not own property, he could not vote, but he could work and earn a living in Athens. Um, and so since he apparently was passed over um, in becoming the director of Plato's school, he had to start his own, which is known now to history as the Lyceum. And there you see uh, what are believed to be the ruins of the Lyceum in Athens, which I recently read that the, uh, that the Greek government is, is going now to try to preserve. Um, Aristotle took a very different approach to understanding the world, took a very different approach um, than Plato did. Whereas Plato emphasized understanding the world from the top down, from um, understanding the world by a, relatively, uh, a relative handful of people, understanding the world by means of the forms, uh, understanding physical things by means of these non-physical qualities, which were essentially uh, existed in their own right. Um, Aristotle took the opposite view. He did accept the existence of forms. He did believe that these qualities were real. For every physical thing, there are forms, there are qualities which give it its identity. Uh, he also believed in the reality of the, the form of justice. But Aristotle's take was that the forms do not exist in a dimension apart from the physical world. They are always and only found with physical things. So for example, the form of redness, 
uh, uh, would only be exist or reside in a red object. It did. It had no reality apart from the objects. So that you al always get form and matter together. So Aristotle um, reworked the idea of forms to bring it sort of, so to speak, down to earth, so that people would understand the forms as giving qualities to physical things because they were always only part of physical things. Um, he was notable for uh, writing more about more different things than any other uh, Greek and probably any, any other individual in the history of Western civilization. And very notably, he organized knowledge into its major categories, which are, are pretty much the same now as they were then. Um, he organized social knowledge into ethics and politics. Um, for Aristotle, and for, for all of the Greeks actually, you could not separate your ethics, your ethical life as an individual, from your life as a citizen, your life in the polis, your political life. Now, of course, Aristotle was speaking and writing only for um, the educated men of Athens, the, whose sons were his students. Um, and so he uh, made ethics a branch of politics. And the guiding principle for an ethical life, a moral life, was what Aristotle called the mean. Um, he meant by that a life of moderation, not going to extremes. You live the best possible life when you avoid the extremes of excess on the one hand and deficiency on the other. Um, and so if you live a life of moderation, you will be a virtuous individual, and, and he stressed virtues that are still recognized. For example, the virtue of temperance, controlling your physical appetites so that they don't control you. Um, the virtue of courage, so that you'll be willing to fight to protect your family, your fellow citizens. Um, and virtues such as generosity, um, being, but being careful so that you don't go to extremes. For example, you wouldn't want to give away too much. You wouldn't want to give away everything you have because that would leave you penniless and would mean that you were not a very prudent person. You didn't make wise decisions. But on the other hand, you wouldn't want to be stingy. Um, and so you had to find the mean. You had to find the right balance in between stinginess and, and wastefulness. Um, and so that mean would be generosity. So all of this was necessary. The reason to live a good life as an individual was so that you would be a more productive citizen. You would be so, th so that your, your morality informs your citizenship. Uh, and so ethics and politics were one area of knowledge that he developed extensively in his, in his lectures and in his writings. Uh, and by the way, we don't have any original texts from any of these people. We have only copies that were, were preserved by their disciples and then later people. The other area of a major area of knowledge that Aristotle uh, cataloged and wrote a great deal about was natural history. Um, he was a biologist, or what passed for a biologist. In fact, when Alexander the Great went on his conquests, he would send back specimens of plants and animals to his old teacher. Uh, but Aristotle classified and cataloged living things, plants and animals, and he came up with definitions for them based on their functions. And so the definition, he recognized human beings were animals, they had biological functions, and yet they had a unique characteristic. Um, and the defining characteristic that make uh, that, that made humans unique animals was their rationality, their reason. So he defined humans as the rational animal. That was his biological definition for humans. He also studied the weather. He wrote about meteorology. Um, Athens had a very beautiful climate. People spent a lot of time outdoors and they, they studied the stars. They were gifted astronomers. And um, Aristotle was no different. And so he studied and wrote about meteorology, uh, about the weather. Um, he studied the, the, the physical world and wrote about uh, a book called The Physics, in which he talked about what the physical world was like and tried to describe it and organize the knowledge of the physical world. But he had a broader understanding of the cosmos that later came to be known as metaphysics, the kind of knowledge that goes beyond the physical world. Um, and for Aristotle, all of the aspects of the physical world had to be explained by virtue of what he called telos, and we get our English word teleology from that. Everything has its own proper telos, which simply means everything has its own natural function. Its function defines its purpose. So for example, uh, since humans um, are by nature rational, that tells you something about how humans are supposed to live, what they're supposed to do. They're supposed to do things that require the exercise and development of intelligence. Um, and so 
the natural telos of a human being is rationality, which means that the purpose of human life is to live intelligently, to create a society that exemplifies human intelligence. Um, and then the, the cosmic telos that Aristotle believed would explain every individual thing in the cosmos was what he called the unmoved mover. Um, which was uh, the best way to explain it is that uh, a later philosopher called it thought thinking about itself. Um, Aristotle was actually, um, he believed that the, the, the best of all existing things was thought, uh, rationality. Uh, and so the highest entity that he believed must exist would be the unmoved mover, a form of pure intelligence, n not a god or a deity, but a, a form of intelligence that served as a, like a focal point for the development of everything else. Um, and so um, Aristotle seems to have continued, uh, for example, the quest of Anaxagoras and other pre-Socratic philosophers to look for what we would now call natural laws, um, the natural principles that explain the entire cosmos. Um, and so he organized knowledge into its major categories, ethics and politics, natural history, and metaphysics. But he also, he did something that uh, was, was unique. The Greeks were great debaters. They were great um, speechifiers. They liked to debate ideas and discuss. And Aristotle noticed that there were certain ways of thinking and reasoning that were natural to human beings. And so what he did was to catalog them and teach them um, as logic. Uh, the, the, he wrote the world's first logic textbook, um, which was called the Organon. It was given that title by his later disciples. And he introduced, a, or, or he didn't introduce it, he did not invent it, but he described and he formalized and he systematized instruction in what we now call formal or deductive logic, the logic of the syllogism. And so you'll see in this slide an example of the type of logic that Aristotle taught based on his observation of the way human beings naturally think and reason. And we still teach it this way. Uh, syllogism is a very simple three-line argument of the, of the type that you see on the slide. Um, there are two premises which together lead to a conclusion. Um, the first premise is all bachelors are un unmarried men. This represents the fact that, that Aristotle loved to show relationships, right? He loved to create definitions which expressed the natural proper functions of things. And so you, hear, you have a definition here. What is a bachelor? Well, a bachelor is an unmarried man. All bachelors are unmarried men. And so he shows how the categories are related. For example, you have the category of bachelors, the category of unmarried men, and in the second premise you have another category, all unmarried men are mortals. So if you take those two propositions, those two true statements and put them together, all bachelors are unmarried men, all unmarried men are mortals, um, you are naturally, by the force of logic, led to a conclusion, therefore all bachelors are mortals. And so you can see we can represent the structure of this argument by using these little Venn diagrams we call them. There you see in the middle the category of bachelors and it fits inside a larger category of unmarried men. All bachelors are unmarried men. And when you say that all unmarried men are mortals, you can see that that class fits inside the larger class of mortals. So by the time you express the conclusion, therefore all bachelors are mortals, you can see that it's already um, um, expressed in this little diagram. And so he taught, Aristotle taught the logic of the syllogism, which became the type of formal logic that was used for centuries afterwards by the medieval theologians, for example. Uh, most of Aristotle's writings were unfortunately lost to the West for hundreds of years, but they did, the, the Western scholars, um, who were medieval theologians, had his logic, and so they used it uh, in their own work. Later his work was discovered uh, during the Crusades, having been preserved by um, Arabic scholars and um, in, in the West. Um, and so, um, that concludes um, our lecture in Greek philosophy, and uh, you can study philosophy at uh, the Department of History and Political Science at Southeastern.
All right, so we've now discussed a bit about culture and a little bit about philosophy as far as the Greeks are concerned. Now we're going to turn, for our next lecture, turn our attention back to a very famous, famous uh, man who was not actually Greek. He was from Macedonia, which is a little bit north of Greece. And he is known as Alexander the Great. I'm sure you probably, most of you have heard of Alexander the Great. He uh, accomplished quite a lot in his very short lifespan. He died when he was in his early 30s, but yet he conquers um, a, a, an amazing amount of territory. And we'll find out about uh, more about Alexander the Great um, for our next lecture, our upcoming lecture. Until next time.